So basically what I want to talk to you about now uh, is kind of building your own PTM dome, how to go about it, things to think about um, in designing it for your application. I'm not going to speak in specifics about how to build it, uh, where to get the parts, things like that. I'm not going to go over that. There's a lot of variables in how you build it. I kind of want to go over the minimum requirements, the basic theory of what you need to utilize this system. You can always go further. Um, getting your images for, you, for making a PTM can be very simple, um, but it can also be very labor intensive if you do that. We've had some automation done on this to kind of streamline things a little bit, and that's really the more complicated part. That's, that's the electronics and the software part of it. Um, so with that, I'll get going. So your minimum requirements. The basic thing you need to make a PTM and to capture images to be able to make a PTM are repeatable lighting locations. The software needs to know where those lights are. And if you can repeat those positions, that makes it much easier. You don't have to recreate a new light position file every time you want to make a PTM. It can be very, very simple. There is somebody I know that is doing some coin, ancient coin photography on the web, and they have a setup where they have literally just taken a piece of butcher paper, and they've drawn a compass on it with marked points. And they have a light stand, which is an on-off light, with three heights. They set it at height one, position one. You know, he's pre-measured that, knows what that is takes the picture, moves the light to height two, takes the picture, moves the height to light three, takes the picture, moves it over to position two, one, two, three. And he continues that until he has all the pictures he wants. And he has developed a light position file or taken measurements for those compass points that he's predetermined. And he makes his, uh, makes his PTM from that. It works very well. It's labor intensive though. It's not something you want to necessarily do you know, at the scene. It's not going to be quick. Uh, but that's just to give you an idea that really all you need at a minimum type of level to do this. You just need to know where those lights are and be able to reposition them in about the same location. It's fairly flexible as far as where the lighting is on your measurements. You don't have to be hyper accurate in them. Your uh, positional measurements that you take can be off by about a centimeter either way and you'll still get a good PTM. You also need, uh, oh, and I'm really going to recommend at least 50 positions to get a nice even coverage and give you some smooth transitions. <coughs> um, Mr. Malsbender was saying you can do it with a minimum of 32 and still get a fairly decent file. I've seen some that were made with 32 and they work, um, but with a larger number, it tends to give you a little smoother transition as you're moving the uh, cursor around in that program to change your lighting angles. We went with 64 basically because it divided evenly. It was easy for us to position. Uh, 64 and do it that way. You're also going to need the uh, light position file. This is where you're telling the fitter program where those lights are in three-dimensional space. And it's just a simple XYZ coordinate system, but it's converted into a vector and then that's normalized. And I've got a slide we'll go through how to do that. Um, you set it up in an Excel spreadsheet, you just enter it once and then it does all the rest for you. You're also going to need a computer. Where's my cursor? You need, of course, a computer and the PTM software. There's two components to the PTM software as you guys have played with. There's the fitter program, and then there's the viewer program. The fitter program is the part that actually creates the PTM file. The viewer program is the part that views that file or opens it and allows you to work with it. And of course, you need a digital camera. In a technical sense, you don't actually need a digital camera, you need a digital file. So if you really, really want to use film, you can do it. You just have to convert those images to a digital format after the fact. So it's got to be a J, and remember this only recognizes JPEG, TGA, and PPM file formats. So really JPEG is your only option at this point, because those other file formats are kind of obsolete. So if you want to really, really want to use film, you can get a set of those images converted to a JPEG file format as long as they're still in the right sequence, one through 64 or one through however many flash positions you have, you can make a PTM file from them. Uh, the position should be evenly distributed around the hemisphere. The portable dome that you guys have worked with today and yesterday, 
if you'll notice uh, in that, that arc movement as it comes across, there's a gap where it stops and then you come back over the uh, other side. I think it's about a 75 degree gap across the top. Um, we left that open because physically if I put that arc dead center at 90 degrees, it's going to block the camera lens. Now, we kind of left it a little low angle when we initially designed it because we thought, well, those are the more important you know, lighting positions to look at for oblique light. You know, these really vertical ones aren't going to give us much information. Well, it turns out, when, if you look closely at PTMs that are made from those files, there's, if you think of that circle that you have that represents that hemisphere, there's an I-shaped gap where those lights were not, where there was no flash positions. If you're working in that upper I-shaped gap, you'll kind of, it'll be dark, you won't get a lot of shadow, it won't, you won't see it move very much. That's because of that gap in the lighting positions. Now, on this third one that we want to build, I'm going to tighten that gap up, and I want to close it down a little bit. Um, not having those positions does give you, you know, kind of like a dark area, as I said. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter, you know, having them only low angle didn't really help. So I really, I want to close that up and make it a more even distribution throughout. Uh, the first one that Mr. Malsbender built, he actually went through and plotted and calculated an exact even distribution of those 50 lights. That black dome that we, you know, had up here. He calculated a completely even distribution for those. Went through a lot of mathematics to get it, you know, perfectly equally distributed around that whole hemisphere. And he said, basically, you really don't need that. It, it doesn't have to be that hyper accurate. But you kind of generally want, you know, a nice even distribution across that hemisphere. Again, 50 positions will easily cover a hemisphere, and the additional positions are going to give you smoother transitions when you're viewing the file. The lighting sequence that sequence in which you fire the flash and capture the pictures must be consistent. It's, it's really going to save you a lot of grief in moving around because flash one has got to equal picture one for the program to know where to look. If flash one sometimes is picture two, it's not going to know where to look. You can fire them in any sequence you want, you could go across the dome or whatever. As long as it always does it the same way and it knows this flash is in this position and it equals this picture. As long as that is always consistent, it's going to work fine. If it starts changing, you'll get a PTM file, but the lights are going to move in the wrong direction when you move your cursor and it's just going to do some weird things. So whatever sequence you have it set up to fire in, it has to match the way that light position file was, was built, the way it's numbered. So it always has to be consistent. And the lighting positions, when you go to make your light position file, we just used a simple XYZ coordinate system. Literally laid down a piece of tape at the center for an X-axis, piece of tape in the center crossing for a Y-axis, and Z is the distance from the ground. Just use, you know, the good old, you know, math, Positive, positive coordinate, positive, negative coordinate, uh, negative, negative coordinate, negative, positive for your X, Y, and Z. And then Z is always positive because it goes up from the ground. Literally just took a, a tape measure, measured over, measured up, took a plumb bob from about the center position of the flash and measured the distance to height. Wrote all that information down, took it to the nearest eighth of an inch. So again, not hyper accurate. Then you have to convert those measurements to a normalized vector value. The way you do that, you just take the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. That gives you uh, the vector value, and then to normalize them, you take each of your x, y, and z coordinate numbers and divide it by that value. You have to do that for each lighting position. So what we did to make, where's my cursor, make life easier. You can see here, this is for the portable dome. So we have position, flash position number one. And I hope, yeah, that's pretty clear and it's firing strobe one. Remember we had eight strobes on that arm and it's at the arc position one. So the very first uh, indent for that arc. So then I measured my x coordinate at 16 and 5 eighths, my y coordinate 4 and 4 eighths. I just kept everything in eighths. And uh, z at 3 and 4 eighths heights. I then just converted that to decimal over here to make, make it a little bit easier to work with. Then over here I input this formula, the square root of this cell squared plus this cell squared plus this cell squared. Just enter that into Excel and it's going to give you an answer. 
once you've entered that formula, you can copy that formula down the row of your spreadsheet. And it'll automatically give you the numbers. It'll just recalculate it, boom. It's very simple once you have that first cell entered. Then over here, this is the normalized value. So you're going to take this value, in this case it was about 17.57, and you're going to divide x by that number, and then that answer comes over here. You're going to divide y by this value, and that number comes over here. You're going to divide z by that value, and this number comes over into this column. So these are the normalized vector lengths values for each flash position. So you have to have it for both your x, for all your x, y, and z coordinates. These are the numbers, these are the numbers in this column that are going to be entered into that light position file. So those blank LP files that you saw, I think I opened up for a couple of you guys, you've got an image, underscore, and then it's blank because then we, we put the numbers of the images in after the fact. And then you have those three columns of numbers, well that's X, Y, and Z. And that's these numbers, that's where they came from. It's just the measurements of the positions of those flashes. The light position file itself is a very simple uh, program. It's nothing complicated. It's just a text document. It's just a text file, notepad. So you can open up, all your Microsoft Word has notepad on it. You just open it up. Um, you want to put whatever your fi starting file number is, your image name. So you notice all the images that are captured, they start with this prefix, img underscore. If you have something else, you just need to make sure that that is what's entered. Because this is telling it what image, the, what the name is of the picture that you're going to. Okay? And then you've got your X column, your Y column, and your Z column. And you just input that in, and you can actually copy and paste that from Excel into a notepad. And it's just a column format. So you're going to have every, now I chopped this off. This is, uh, this is the first eight from that spreadsheet that I'd shown you before, but you're going to have a string of 64 of them. Your image number must correspond to the light position that captured that image. And what we did, because we automated it, this file, this name is blank because our numbers are sequential. The camera is, continues to, to, to number higher every picture it takes. You could have this saved where your image numbers are constant within that light position file. But then you need to change your image numbers that you captured to match that static file. I left, went with a sequential numbering system because I'm concer I was concerned in that when you select browse, you tell it where to save those images when you're capturing them. If you forget to change that on a second impression, it's going to overwrite the previous files if the numbers are the same. So when using this system, if I forget to change that folder, my images are going to go from 1 to 128 instead of 64, and I go, oops, I forgot to change it. I can copy those bottom 64 into another folder, and I'm still okay. It won't overwrite them that way. But what that means is I need to change my image number name in this light position file to match the numbering that I had. That's what that LP create, that little bat file that you've been using, that's all it does. It adds the numbers in to this light position file to match the images that you've captured. So when you were working with it, you type LP create, that's to tell that computer, I want you to use the program called LP create. Then you space and you tell it, I want you to start at this number. That's the number you enter, that first image number that you captured. And that bat file numbers, it knows into number 64 times consecutively from that starting number that you've given it. The next part, is you're telling it what I want you to name that light position file. So, you know, whatever name you gave it, um, tire, tire one, whatever, you're going to tell it, that's how I want you to output the name of that light position file that you're making now. So, a light position file pops up that's called tire. The reason you want to put that name in is because of the further automation that we've done. That go command, that's another bat file. And in there, you renamed it tire because you're telling it to look for the light position file named tire. Okay, so it's, it's up to you what you call it. They just need to match. That go is going to look for a file called tire.lp. If you name it something else, it won't find it because it's looking specifically for tire. 
if you name your light position file tire2 and your go file says tire, it won't find tire2. You can simply go back into the go file and tell it change that, that line to tire2 and now it goes, oh, I know what to look for and it will find that file. So that's just the automation part of that go bat. It sort of simplifies running the PTM file itself or the fitter program, okay? Your computer. Most modern computers are going to be adequate to run this. It's going to depend on the size of the images you're running to a certain extent and how much you want to work with them. You guys noticed uh, when we were trying to run directly off some of the thumb drives, it was very slow. Okay, the processing speed was, was low. Um, some of these uh, the laptops were running kind of slow when it was creating the PTM file. Basically, the faster your computer, the faster this program is going to work. Um, and the smaller your image file sizes are, the faster it's going to work. Because there's really a lot of data processing. When you guys hit that go command and it started making your PTM, you saw that counter, row, and that number started going up. Well, what it was doing is that polynomial equation we showed you yesterday is the, the pixels are, for these images, are about 3,600 by 2,400. So there's 2,400 rows of 3,600 pixels. It's running that equation for all 3,600 pixels across that row, and it's counting up those rows. So that's basically how fast it's running that math through on these computers. It's pretty impressive to me. But when you look at that number and it's counting up, it, that's what it's doing. It's telling you what row it is currently processing on those images. And then when it finishes, it says, okay, I'm done calculating the numbers, and it's going to say writing PTM file uh, to, to your folder. It's packaging it up in that .ptm format. It's taking all that, that polynomial data, and it's putting it into its little f uh, file package. And now you've got the PTM file pops up, and that's what you can open with the viewer program. And they are separate programs. So I'm really going to recommend, you know, to run about a gigabyte of RAM. It seems to run pretty smoothly. Um, the laptop, uh, the Toshiba, the big silver one that we're working with on the, uh, the laboratory dome, the big white one, that has about a gigabyte of RAM, and it does have a video processing card in it. Um, those are kind of basically gaming computers. Uh, and I'm also going to recommend at least 60 gigabytes of storage space, which should be pretty easy to come by nowadays. You know, on a hard drive, that's uh, actually a fairly small hard drive now. Um, the second one, the laptop, the, the VIO that we had on the portable one, uh, that's got uh, two gigabytes of memory, and it seems to run a little bit quicker, uh, but it's not super noticeably faster than the other one. Um, I have run these on our desktop computers at work. They have about 512 megabytes of RAM. They'll open all the file sizes that you guys have worked with today uh, without too much of an issue. It's a little bit slow. When you move it around, it can kind of you know, freeze up here and there as you work with it. When we went to the very large image sizes that uh, the camera on that white dome is capable of taking, those actually crashed our desktop computers with 512 meg. It, it just did not have enough memory to even open the file. So it, you gotta, you're going to have to strike that balance of computing power, usability. Um, you know, I kind of leave it up to you, but really as a minimum recommendation, I'd recommend at least a gigabyte of RAM for whatever computer you're going to run this on. It just works much smoother, much faster. And as I stated, you know, you increase the memory and your graphics cr uh, processing capability is going to improve the performance and the operation of the, the, the viewing of the file. And as I just stated, your large image files are really going to increase the requirement on your computing power and storage space. If you're capturing 10 to 15 megabyte images, remember you have 64 of those. And then the final PTM file at that level is going to be around 120 to 130 megabytes. So you're talking around a little over a gigabyte of data that needs to be stored. You know, these are evidence prints. You're going to have to keep that stuff. So the, the really, really big files are going to require a lot of storage space. At the level that you've been using today, we are equivalent to 35 millimeter film in line resolution, and that's going to be the next presentation. And you're going to be able to copy all 64 of your images and a, fin a finished PTM file, and you're going to be able to burn that onto a 750 megabyte CD-ROM. It will all fit on there. You won't get two complete packages on there, but you can fit it onto a CD-ROM. And at that level, you're still equivalent to 35 millimeter film, 
think that's pretty good. Um, if later on, as I discussed with uh, Photoshop, if you want to make a smaller PTM to email to somebody, you can reprocess those original images and save them at a lower resolution as a second set, an altered set, if you will. And then remake another PTM from those smaller files that is much smaller that can be emailed easily. So those are the options. You know, that's going to be kind of up to how you guys want to handle it in your lab system. Uh, as you know, the PTM software runs through DOS. Uh, and there's the two separate components to the PTM software. You have the PTM fitter program, and that's run separately from the viewer after your image capture, which creates that PTM file using the captured images and your light position file. And again, those light position files are specific to the dome that you have set up. So you, we had two domes today. Each of those folders has a different light position file because the lights are in different places. If you try and switch, switch them, it'll still make something, but it's not going to look right. Uh, and again, it only recognizes really the JPEG image file format. And then there, your viewer is that part of the program that actually opens the .ptm file so you can view it and work with it. Here's kind of a pictorial representation of what's going on. So over here is just four source for photographs. So these are like what you captured. Uh, it would be times 64 in our case. So we're using the JPEG. This is your light position file down here. The fitter program takes the source photograph and this vector positional information, runs that polynomial equation on all of them, and then it packages it into this PTM file. Now your viewer program then opens that PTM file for viewing. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, that's what's going on. The digital camera. Oh. While you're capturing the images, the position of your camera cannot change. You don't want to change your settings. You don't want, to, you don't want the zoom to change. You don't want your, your focal length to change while the images are being captured. All 64 of those images need to be consistently positioned. If something shifts while you're capturing them, what it's going to show up as is blur. It's going to be like the object moved during a long shutter exposure. Your PTM file, each of your 64 images is going to look fine. But because the position has changed, when they're combined, it's going to be like a blurry image, like it moved. So you're going to have like an overlap kind of effect in the finished PTM file if that camera changes position while they're being captured. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. You, uh, also tell them about <coughs> there are some lenses, zoom macro lenses, as they uh, sit yes, down. Yes. Um, <laughs> there's a little bit of a stutter <laughs> on them. You know, so the cheaper the lens, actually, this was a Canon lens that we yes. found this on. Yes. And, you know, it, it, we took pictures and, and all of a sudden it started getting blurry. What happened was the yeah. camera focus was bouncing yeah. around a little bit. What, when we, and so we had a problem. Yeah, we, we started taking something yeah. and went, why are these so blurry? They're really bad at right. the edges. And, and you could see it when you blew up in the scales. You could see the scale, the images of the scales, the uh, uh, graduations were offset. There was like multiple offset scale you know bars on this what's going on what happens we turn when we turn the camera upside down so the lens is pointing down gravity was pulling the focus out so as it was taking the pictures it was slowly changing its focus right. just because gravity was pulling that lens down so whenever you see that you might try to diagnose it by looking at your lens see if your yeah. lens is shifting a little bit because it's just the weight and it really depends on the weight of the lens too. Yeah. Some of the newer lenses the, with the stability control are much, much better. Yeah. They, they are much better, but you pay a, a high premium for them. Some are like 1200 bucks for the lens, yeah. but it's well worth it if you're looking for a stable thing. And, and, and with this many images, you wanna make sure that you don't have to take them multiple times. <laughs> Um, and of course, you want sufficient resolution for your application. You know, we've been talking about meeting 35 millimeter line equivalency as kind of a benchmark. That's the benchmark that we set. If you have an application that's a very small object, quarter size, 
you could probably get away with a much lower resolution if you're filling the frame of that sensor. Okay, because really it's object size to sensor size is kind of a big part of what your final image resolution is going to be. So if your object is actually physically smaller than your camera sensor, you're going to get very good resolution with a lower megapixel camera because that object is small and matches the size of that sensor better. So that, that's something we've, we've set for footwear impressions, fairly large objects, relatively speaking, to the size of our sensors. We set 35 millimeter film as our benchmark. We wanted to be able to make that resolution. So that's why we chose the cameras that we did and we're using the settings that we are. But for those of you that are not doing or you know, want to do maybe something small like a dental, uh, you know, a dental cast or something, a quarter, some small object, if that's all you know you're going to be doing, you could you know, get a camera that's going to meet the requirements that you need. That's why I'm saying I'm leaving this open for you guys to design. This is why we selected the resolution setting that we did. But just you want to make sure that you look at it and think about the resolution that you're, you're, you're using and make sure it makes sense. Because again, if you get really high, you're going to be using a lot of computing power and a lot of storage space to use this. And, and if you don't need it for your application, you, know, you might want to back down on that. Something to think about in making these. I think that point is very important to make on that because, I mean, you can go anywhere from 2 to 10 to 16.7 megapixel resolution. But what do you need as far as that thing? Because obviously you saw the file size. The 75 megabytes <laughs> yeah. is a lot. In the, in the medium format that we're using right now, if we went to a high resolution format, my gosh, those things would be huge. Uh, but having said that, I, I think that you need to kind of consider. So if you're doing a latent print, I, mean, I, I wouldn't even think you would need two to four you know, on, on that size. But uh, we chose a 11 by 17 yeah. format, yeah, we went to and that was what we now. used kind of as a standard to compare to 35 millimeter. Now, if you used a 4 by 4 inch one, your, your resolution standard would be much different. You know, at a 4 megapixel, you could probably get away with a very good line resolution that's similar to 35 millimeter. So in digital photography, it's much different than in emulsion photography in that you know you, you have to consider the size of the object as opposed for resolution um, something else one of the other reasons for recommending an SLR style camera versus say one of these uh, zoom point and shoot fixed lens things um, you really need to be able to if you want to automate this especially you need to be able to hook that camera into the computer and control the camera through the computer most of the point and shoot styles will not allow you to do that you're also going to lose the flexibility of being able to use different lenses, different zoom lengths, different quality of lenses, adding filters if that's something you want to do. Because, yeah, you can add filters and take your pictures. Um, you also need to get the software development kit if you're going to automate. That is available through each camera manufacturer. It's specific to each camera manufacturer. So if you're going to use a Canon camera, you need to get the Canon software development kit. You can use Nikon, you got to get their software development kit. Those cameras have software on them and they're written differently. And that's basically a blank program that a software developer can open up and add some lines and coding. Uh, the controller program that you worked with that's running that dome, that was developed from the software development kit for the Canon cameras. Okay? Um, well, we didn't write that software and I personally am not capable of doing it. Uh, but that's something you're going to need to get and know that it's available. So that's something to think about when you're selecting your camera. Canon is very free with giving their kits. They'll pretty much, you can just download them, no problem. Nikon and Kodak, they'll give them to you without a problem, but you have to sign kind of a release form. You have to mail that to them. Uh, I don't know about some of the other brands as far as like Fuji and Minolta and Pentax. Uh, I haven't had contact with them. I don't know how difficult or easy it would be to get their development kits but that's something you need, need to have, especially if you're going to automate it. And, of course, the camera needs to have, you know, like I said, the connection to the computer. So a USB or a IEEE FireWire port, some way of connecting that camera to the computer so it can, the computer can talk to the camera and you can download those images. Now, you don't have to download the images directly to the hard drive. You could store them on the uh, um, card in the camera and then transfer them later and make your PTM files. That's an option. But in the automation, since you're hooked up to the computer anyway, 
to control it, I figure you might as well download them right into the file folder. Oh, went too far. If you're going to automate, there's some additional complications. You need to synchronize that shutter, the camera shutter, with the firing of the flash. That's what that controller box is doing for us. It's timing the firing of the flash at the same time it's telling the camera to take the picture. Our cameras do not realize that there is a flash hooked up to them. So if you leave, that's the other reason for going to the manual exposure. If I leave it on auto exposure, it's going to think, oh, I'm really dark, I need a 30 second exposure, because it doesn't realize a flash is going to go off. So that's why I set it in manual, because otherwise you're sitting and waiting for a 30 second exposure that's not needed. Okay. Yeah? Did you ever consider slating the flashes? Uh, how so? Uh, using a uh, flash slave. Like the optical sensor? Yeah. yeah, those those the small Vivitar flashes that we have, those are slave flashes. We deactivated the, the uh, optical sensor because what happens is whenever any flash fires, the others are going to detect it and they're all going to fire. Well, you can uh, you can use you can do a radio slave though, as opposed to an optical. Yeah, uh, yeah, on the bigger flashes you can. Yeah, the big uh, the hot shoe flashes you can set them uh, usually about four channels. Uh, so you've got four different channels. You can run four. You might be able to double that. You might be able to get to eight. They're physically very large, though. I haven't seen any small ones uh, that operate that way. So they really aren't going to fit very well. So yeah, I mean, if you could find a small one that works, sure. But it still needs to be timed with the firing of that camera. So some way those flashes have to talk to the computer program to know that a picture is being taken. Okay, so yeah, I mean, if you could set that up, if you've got a good electronic software guy that, that can do that, sure, that'll work. But those are those, those requirements for automation. The camera has to open at the time the flash is fired. It's got to be sequenced. Okay, that's what that controller box is doing. There's, there's a chip written in there that's telling it one. Fire one, and then go to fire, flash two, go to flash three. At the same time, it's saying, okay, take the picture, take the picture, take the picture. So the controller box is actually sequencing our flashes, it's controlling the order of the firing. And it's telling the software that I'm firing now, the software is telling the camera, take a picture. Okay? And that's just the way our automation setup it was, was developed. So that's the controller box, and as we said, the modified uh, software development kit, SDK, is controlling the timing of those lights and the camera. It's kind of connecting those components together to synchronize and operate together. And then we have it set so the images are just downloaded to a designated folder. That's not a requirement. That's the way we've done it. You could do it differently if that works better for you. Of course, uh, automation, we also had, uh, they created some simple bat files to kind of automate making that light position file for us that I talked about and running the fitter program. Um, there's got to be a better way. I, I know a good software designer can has got to be able to come up with just a button that you can push that's make PTM, something like that. Unfortunately, I'm not a software designer. Uh, so this is kind of the guy that made the dome for us. Uh, this is what he developed, and we got it to work. It, it, uh, it is a little cumbersome. but um, and That's what I talked about earlier. You could also, instead of renaming your uh, or redoing your LP file, you can rename your image files and have a static LP file. And, you know, of course, the, uh, the I've talked about throughout the day, yesterday, the Adobe Photoshop really allows you a lot of, a lot of additional flexibility with using this in that ability to process all the photos uh, equally and then save them into a separate file folder so you can create multiple PTMs. You, so this would be one way you could rename them. If you wanted to have a static LP file, you could run them through Photoshop and just have a rename function that's going to rename those original images and save them to a second folder that matches your LP file. So that would be an additional step if you wanted to, instead of remaking the LP file, you could run, it through, run your images through Photoshop to rename them to match your LP file. You can also change your file format. So if somebody really likes raw images, you really like TIFF images, whatever you want to capture them in, you can capture your original images in whatever file format you want, run them through Photoshop, have them resaved as a JPEG to make your PTM. So those are options that are available. It, you can do it that way. You, if you want to crop it, you can have them all crop. You can crop all 64 identically, running through this batch file process in Adobe Photoshop to crop down. You can resize them. As I said, you can make a smaller image if you want to make a very tiny PTM for emailing, something like that. 
some design considerations. When you're building your actual light dome, some things to think about. The output of the flash is going to determine the distance that that flash needs to be away from the object. That determines the radius of your dome. The brighter your flash, the further away you need to be. It's just flash photography like you guys have practiced for years. If you get a flash too close, you're going to white it out. It's the same thing. You just need to get a distance that balances for your particular flash to give you a good image. Okay? Once you have that radius determined based on your fl flashes that you're using, that's going to kind of determine the overall size of your dome. You, you can't go smaller than that radius because you don't want to have anything in there. So that portable one is, is fairly wide because we had to use that distance for the radius of those flashes to get a good image. So now we have to go outside that radius area for the framework, and it, and it became fairly large. You say when we're going to be working with the LEDs, we're going to get a lower output light. I think we can come in closer and make the overall size smaller. You say, yeah? You know you're going to be consistently working with a small object. You can reverse that process of thinking, right? Now you want a dome, say, this big, and now get a light to fit that dome instead of the other way? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we had that student intern, you know, an eight-inch diameter dome. He used some very low-voltage LED lights. You know, they're very low. They didn't put out a lot of light. He was very close, and it worked fine. So, you know, you just need to pick a light source that's going to work for the distance that, that you need to have. Uh, you know, we use this because we were looking at footwear tire impressions. Again, somewhat large objects that needs to fit over them. Um, and, and the commercial availability. You know, we went with off-the-shelf slave flashes. Um, we're, we're trying to get, you know, work with uh, uh, basically a uh, electrical in, uh, designer to try and get some lower voltage stuff that we can sequence and hook up. Um, the one that our student built was not automated in any way. It was just simply an on-off toggle switch wired to each flash. So he would turn the turn it on, and it's just on constantly. Take his picture, turn it off. Turn on the second one, take his picture, turn it off. Turn on the third one. You know, so on and so forth. So, you know, something like that, it worked. It worked very well. It's just more manual. So we're trying to get something that we can automate like this in sequence. So we need to hook up to a controller box that's going to control the firing of those small LEDs. So. How many lights did he use? Your, your he actually built one with 64. He got so 64 little inch. LEDs on an 8-inch. Wow. Yeah. He also, he, he played around with it where he would take images with all 64, and then he also took images using only 32. Of those of those lights, so he would like skip every other one when he turned them on and off. And I've seen them, and they're really to me, I didn't notice any difference between the 32 and the 64 at that small radius level. So if you're talking small, you could probably reduce the number of flashes that you need and still get a good image file. Um, it, you know, something to play with and think about. These are just you know at this point we're still fairly new into these different. Yeah, diameters and different applications. So this, I'm just kind of trying to convey what we've known, we've done, and I know that it's going to kind of work. Um, if you want to go beyond that, it's going to be up to you guys to you know, fit your application. I'll be happy to help you as much as I can. Um, also, something to think about is your camera positioning. How are you going to position that on your light lighting fixture? You saw that third one that we're talking about building. We're not going to have a camera mount directly on it. Uh, we're thinking of putting a tripod just next to it that goes over it because it is fairly small. These are large enough that a tripod really wouldn't work very well, so we had mounts developed for them. You're also going to need to match the focal length of your lens to how far away that camera is mounted. That's one of the reasons we went with zoom lenses instead of a, like a fixed 50 millimeter. Those cameras are pretty high above the object, and to be able to fill that frame properly with, you know, you, one time you may have a partial impression that's just a heel that's fairly small, and then another time you may have a large heel, a large full impression of a size 14 that you need to fill. You need to back that out. Well, we went with a straight 50 millimeter fixed lens. When we got down to that little heel impression, we're not going to be able to drop that camera low enough to fill the frame with a 50. It, it won't go there. The arc would actually hit it at that point. So we went with a zoom lens to allow us to bring that up because we only have a limited distance that we could go down to bring the camera to the, ob to the, Im the object that we're imaging. Okay, so something else to think about, where your camera's going to be and what zoom level you're going to run your lens at to be able to get a good 
good photograph and fill the frame with the object that you're capturing. Um, the one that was done on the microscope, this one that the student built, that the camera was actually on the trinocular head. So that was uh, framed using the optics of the microscope. So the ocular of the microscope was actually looking through the top of the dome. And then using the magnification changes, he was able to focus it up to the camera and do it that way. So if you're talking about a system like that, you know, maybe through a stereo microscope, something like that, you can use those optics to kind of frame, frame your picture. And something else, crime scene use. Um, that was kind of the ultimate goal of our portable one, is to be able to take these things out in the field. So some of the things we needed to think about were mobility. Um, it wound up a little large, it's not as mobile as I'd like on the second one. The third one we're hoping is going to be really truly mobile. But that camera mount that we have, you pull some pins and that whole thing folds down. So that whole dome folds down flat, put it up on your side, it's going to slide into our crime scene vehicle relatively easily. It's, it's kind of heavy. But these are things to think about in however you design. You guys saw some of the other pictures like the spider web design, that big arc for the walls. Th there's many, many different ways of setting this up and creating that hemisphere of light. You just kind of need to come up with something that works for your application. For us, this was the easiest to manufacture and it worked for us. Now, I've, you know, some other ideas I've heard of is a Lazy Susan kind of design, like a ball bearing track with a quarter arc that maybe only has four flashes on it and you can rotate that around in a big square. Um, you know, th that's a possibility. I, I was concerned with uh, the, the wires getting cut after multiple uses and moving around, things like that. And it's probably a little more complicated to manufacture. And you've got to deal with the bearing track and some ideas like that. Um, but you know, really, I don't want to limit you guys to using our design. This is just work f is what worked for us for our application. There's a lot of different ways to do this. And it may work better for another application. Your, your dentistry, I mean, you're probably not going to use anything like we have. You're going to want a much smaller one that's maybe more fixed, less portable. And that's going to work for your application. We were mostly concerned with crime scene. We wanted it to be portable. We didn't want to have to be able to plug it into batteries. So our controller box that was designed is powered off the laptop. All the flashes are powered by batteries. So they're replaceable in the field. We have no power connections that we need, any landlines at all. We can move it around in the field. The other thing is contact area. We have, I don't know if you noticed, but there are some small kind of refrigerator feet that are on that bottom of that dome. So our contact area is reduced. We don't want to be putting this big frame into a crime scene and setting it on a shoe impression. We may damage other shoe impressions that are around it. So we really wanted to try and minimize the actual contact area with the scene. Weather. You know, you guys are going to go out there and get rain, sleet, snow, hail. You never know when you're going to go out. It needs to be somewhat weatherproof. Those open circuit boards on our lab dome, the white one, are not going to cut it in the field. They'll get destroyed the first time it rains. So that's why we went with an off-the-shelf kind of a somewhat sealed flash system. Okay? After they were cut open and those wires were put in, we shrink-wrapped them and sealed that opening to help reduce the water coming in. And again, I talked about how are you going to power this. Our lab one has to be plugged into a 110 outlet. So I don't think you want to run a cord out to your scenes. So you kind of need to come up with a battery power, some way of powering the flashes, some way of you know, getting them to fire and providing them with juice. And is it going to be easy to clean up? You get into a real bloody scene, you know, you're going to want to maybe decon it. So you're going to want maybe a surface like we used aluminum. You know, it's pretty resistant to cleaning chemicals. If you know, we get it kind of dirty, we can clean it up pretty easily. All the flashes in the controller box are mounted on that by Velcro. So we can take those off and ho at literally hose that thing down. We can detach all of that equipment pretty quickly to, to clean that frame. And then you can do a delicate cleaning if something gets up on the other area. So just things to think about when you're designing these things. Additional information. Um, these are some papers. I believe you guys have these printed out. Uh, these, these links are printed out in your uh, presentation uh, package. This is a paper uh, HP labs. Uh, it's on reflectance imaging. Gives you a lot of good information about some additional information about how that fitter program works. Um, if you don't want to automate it, you want to run it through manually, it gives you directions on that. Um, you don't have, and part of that thing with that image numbering, you don't have to save your files or your image images to a specific file. The uh, light position file, you can tell it that file string and have all your images in a single folder. 
So you don't always have to keep them in the same way. You can direct that fitter program to a file in a different location on a computer somewhere. So, you know, that's going to be up to how your agency works. Uh, and that this gives you information on that. Another paper on reflectance transformation. Um, this is actually another paper where they used um, this PTM technique on fossil imaging. It's got some, some good information on the mathematics, some additional stuff on how it works, worked for them. Um, it's also a bit of a historical paper, if you will, in that this was being used before we started testing it for forensics. Uh, and then just another paper on uh, surface enhancement technique with uh, a PTM. Uh, if you guys go into these, if you go to this root directory on the internet, just type in hpl.hp.com. That'll get you to their website and just type in the search engine that's on that site, PTM or Tom Malsbender, and it's going to pull up more articles than you probably want to read. They have a lot of good information on their website. They have a lot of links to other websites that are doing stuff using this. Uh, there is one website. Somebody has developed a JavaScript editor or version of this PTM program. You link to that. You can go up and they have PTM images actually on the web. You don't need the viewer program downloaded to your computer. You can actually run it directly through your web browser using this Java app applet that they've developed. So that, that's kind of a neat thing to look at. You don't need to have the programs on your computer. You can also, from here, now we've given you copies of the fitter and the viewer program and the licensing agreement that goes with them. You can also download those viewer and fitter programs from HP's website. F once you go there, you just go to download it and it'll give you downloadable files. Some of the ones, the seeds, the trilobite, some of those PTMs that we've shown you during the week, you can also, when you go to their website, you can download those files. Okay, so if you guys want all that stuff, you know, go to their website. There's, there's a, just a huge amount of information for that. Uh, so with that, I'm going to open this up. Questions on, you know, how to kind of get started on this stuff. Uh, as far as the the feet that you're talking about putting on the bottom, yeah. Um, how critical are the uh, conversion to vector values when you start putting the foot and Thank making you. adjustments? Um, the measurements that you take are kind of to that bottom plane where you know where your object is. I mean, that's we we put our tape on the floor. We took our measurements from the ground level. You can see some effect if the object you're photographing is slightly above or below where your measurements were taken to. You can see some, like kind of a blurry effect at the very edges of the image. You will see that. I've been finding as long as you're within about an inch or so of where you've measured, it's, it's not affecting anything that I've done. If you get up into the three inch range, then it starts to look pretty noticeable at the edges, but the center's still pretty clear. So yeah, you, you need to try and get your object pretty close to where you have. That's one of the reasons for kind of the leveling feet that we have. And, and the system that we use, I, I, I don't like it. It was kind of a first shot to see how it works. It's a little difficult to work with because it's a nut and bolt kind of system. Um, so I know there, there's a better way to do that. Um, but it's pretty much getting us close enough that it hasn't really been an issue. It's fairly flexible. It doesn't have to be exact. You know, you've got a good inch to inch and a half range on either side of where your measurements were taken from. Yeah. I just want to make sure my notes are right. On the 16 megapixel camera, mm -hmm. you're taking 64 shots with each one of those. Each one of those shots is 75 megabytes or so no. leading to a PTM file of 120 to 130. No. At, at a 16, 16 megapixel sensor, the image files are 10 to 13 megabytes. And that gives you a final PTM file size of around 120 to 130 megabytes. Thank you. Okay. That's on the 64. You're going to have 64 images at 10 to 13 megabytes per. But so it really depends on the resolution setting. Yeah. They get 75 megabytes uh, uh, for the file simply because it's on a me medium format. It's not on the uh, yeah. fine or super fine format, which is going to just suck up a lot of memory. Yeah. The, that, that, six, that big camera on the white dome, the 16.71, we have that set to a medium setting, which is about 8.4 megapixels. The Canon 20D on the portable one is set at its highest, which is 8.2 megapixels. Okay? 
and those are the levels where we were able to meet 35 millimeter line resolution equivalency. So we can go beyond that on the one camera. It just increases your file sizes a lot. <laughs>